Welcome everybody to the Cover 2 Podcast. My name is Nick Nina. And I'm Jared Smith. And today we're going to be talking about NFL training camp, a little bit MLB news, and we're going to do a little bit of Cover 5 at the end of it, and of course, Do You Care in the Middle. Jared, how are you doing? Another week off last week as I was uh, in the mountains, being a mountain man, uh, camping and doing stuff like that. Getting so, kicked out of camps. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, we won't talk about that on the podcast. <laughs> there's some stuff that I don't necessarily want to admit, but... Nonetheless, I had a good time. How was your time uh, off, per se? Uh, it was great. It was great. Uh, you know, a lot of work. Uh, so you got to make money. But it was nice. Uh, we had some preseason NFL games go, yeah. this past week. Obviously, Major League Baseball is getting towards the end of their season. So we're starting to see teams who are uh, going to be playoff contenders mm-hmm. coming through. Um, so, yeah, yeah. We've, we've still got some sports going on. Obviously, basketball. Uh, not much going on. We do have Carmelo Anthony officially signing with the Rockets, which we will get into later Absolutely. on in the show. Uh, but I, I have been very, very excited about the NFL. Of course, Hard Knocks is going on right now, which was which airs on Tuesday nights, which was last night. I did watch that as well. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's been a uh, sports filled week. Uh-huh. You know, even though uh, baseball is the only major sport going on with their regular season, we've got the NFL cranking up. Uh, I did go to the movies and see Mission Impossible. How was that? That was very, very good. Do you okay? You know what's funny about this is, do you respect? Tom Cruise's ability to do his own stunts. That's oh, been yeah. a big thing I love going it. on now. I love it. I mean, listen, like certain things you obviously need to have a stunt man for or a stunt team, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But the fact that he does a lot of things on his own, I mean, the guy's crazy. He's insane because there's no way in heck. I mean, maybe if you're paying me the amount of money that he's getting paid, <laughs> exactly. maybe I would consider it. But uh, no, it is pretty cool to see. The movie was great. Uh, I would definitely go watch it again. There's a couple of the movies I want to see. Uh, Megalodon. Uh, even though it looks kind of dumb, I, I do <laughs> want to go see that one. Uh, so yeah, it was a kind of a combination of uh, movie week, sports week, and of course work. So uh, nice. it was great. Overall, how was your uh, camping trip? Very fun. Uh, very tiring near the end of it. We drove 2,000 miles in uh, six or seven days or so. So, you know, think about driving to Phoenix one, you know, back and forth six times. So it's you know it, it's it was it was crazy it was fun people I went with were uh, were awesome included some of my family members and some of my cousins uh, it was an awesome time but I'm very glad to be back on I want, almost want to say the mainland because they, we were in the, <laughs> we were in this big van and we were packed in luckily I got the front seat it was on the tallest one so they gave me the front seat I wasn't packed in or anything like that but nonetheless had a really really good time but I remember that day when I came back. Uh, I was I was dead like I, I it was I was so tired so I'm excited I'm back rejuvenated uh, if my voice sounds a little weird that's only because I drank at the Galaxy game last night it has nothing to do with the trip uh, I got to see Zlatan play last night didn't He's... show out uh, missed the free kick pretty badly too oh. had a chance so that was a little disappointing and they they let a pretty easy goal near uh, near the 90th minute so it was. Uh, a little disappointing, but nonetheless, again, the people I went up with there uh, with as well were, were really fun, and uh, I had a good time. Good time off, but I'm ready to get back into it, you know. Uh, I'm too, way too busy this week already, because the stuff I missed last week, so. <laughs> uh, and then also, uh, big shout out, because I don't know if we'll be able to do a, uh, a final thought later today. Uh, my brother's football season starts this week. Nice. Uh, so I'm excited about that. It starts Thursday. Who are they playing? Uh, they're playing... And I'm sorry, by they, I mean Santa Margarita. Santa Margarita, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're playing Downey, who they should they should be able to beat. But next destroy. week they play Mission Viejo High School, which oh, okay. I, I know you know, and probably people that are around Orange County know that's that's going to be a big game. So. Uh, is that at Mission? That's at Mission. Okay. Yeah, technically a home game, kind of, though, because I live two minutes away from Mission Viejo High School. Right, right. So it's not, not too big of a deal. Practically walk to the game. But nonetheless, let's get to the, let's let's get to the real sports. Not about us. Not about Tom Cruise. Uh, NFL preseason. I'm super excited because we wait all the year, all the the whole year football. The it's the longest off season out of any of the sports, and to finally get some games going was really exciting. I remember when we came back from the trip, uh, that final day was Saturday, and we were actually excited to watch the Cardinals game, even though it's preseason and stuff like that. We wanted to see Josh Rosen. All that, see Sam Bradford not get hurt, see the return of <laughs> David Johnson and stuff like that. So I was excited even for a fake game that doesn't mean anything. Right, no, exactly. And I think it's just because the NFL has the longest offseason of the four major American sports. Exactly, and yeah. so the fact when you say, oh, there's football on, yes, even though it technically does not count uh, towards you know winning or losing, 
It's just the fact of actually seeing players on the field, seeing live NFL action, seeing players hitting each other. Yeah. Um, so, like you mentioned, even though for myself I'm a Cowboys fan, even though, uh, you know, even if it wasn't the Cowboys, I tried to watch as many of the games as I could. Uh, and the fact that there are so many young up-and-coming quarterbacks, rookie quarterbacks, along with other rookie studs like Saquon Barkley, who ripped off a 39-yard run yeah. on his first awesome. carry of his NFL career. Um, so a lot of talent on the field, a lot of position battles going on in Cleveland. Will Baker Mayfield start? Will Tyron Taylor take over in New York? Will Sam Darnold start uh, in Buffalo? Will Josh Allen start? There's so many uh, different storylines going on in the NFL, and, and I think that's good for things because the NFL lately has been marred by the national anthem and so many exactly, things that yeah. don't uh, necessarily relate to on the field that I think it was it was nice to see uh, you know players actually playing the game again and we could actually sit here and discuss and debate football and not unrelated things. I totally agree with that. And you know what's funny? It, it did seem like a lot happened uh, this first week. And that might be because we have a lot of quarterbacks vying for starting spots, a lot of rookie quarterbacks. I feel like the last couple of years we haven't had that. It's been one or two. It's it's been Carson Wentz. It's been Jared Goff. It's you know, uh, let's see how Ezekiel Elliott plays. You know, stuff like that. So, uh, I think and then you know this year you have Baker, you have Josh Allen, Rosen, uh, Darnold, Saquon Barkley, like you mentioned. Uh, so it's very interesting to watch those guys, and most of them had pretty solid debuts as well. Let's kind of I, I say we kind of go. Let's go through them. Let's go through each one of those big rookies. I think that's really what people care about. I mean, you can watch Odell Beckham playing a game. You can watch Ezekiel Elliott and stuff like that. David Johnson was great. But I think people really want to see the rookies and see how they are because this is the first time you're seeing them against NFL talent. So let's start with number one overall pick, Baker Mayfield. Obviously, we see a lot more of him on hard knocks. But Mayfield, what did you think about his uh, his first time playing in an NFL and specifically a Browns uniform? You know, honestly, it was I was I was pleasantly surprised, and and when I say that, I mean that I don't feel that the stage was too big for him. Um, a lot of times for rookies, whether it's a quarterback or whatever position you're saying, um, sometimes they get happy feet. They the the game is moving at such a fast pace, and even though they have obviously played at the collegiate level, which is very fast, the NFL is just a whole different beast. Absolutely. And uh, it did not seem like he was out of control. He was stepping up in the pocket. Uh, he did not seem unfazed. He was making good throws. Uh, he had a nice touchdown to David and Joku. Um, he, he was making you know good decisions, and it, it did not seem like he was rushed or affected by the pace of play. Uh, he did he did get a, a good amount of series, and Tyrod Taylor got the first series of the game, and then Baker Mayfield came in for basically the majority uh, of the, the, I believe, the rest of the first quarter mm -hmm. into the second quarter. So he did get a good amount of action. Um, so he was able to play with some of the starters along with some of the backup guys. So, uh, you know, a lot of times um, if a player in the preseason, you know, has a good game, you kind of have to put an asterisk by it because it's like, okay, well, was he playing against the starters or was he playing against third and fourth string guys yeah. who might not be on an NFL roster pretty soon? Um, I think it was nice for him to go up against the number one defense of the Giants and, the you know, the second string guys, guys who are actually going to be on an NFL field. Mm -hmm. So I was very pleasantly surprised. Um, his demeanor is great. I think he has a good combination of uh, confidence, but not being too cocky. Uh, you know, I think he has a good understanding of the offense, and I, I'm saying this because I've watched Hard Knocks. Have you been able to follow that at all? Uh, I have not seen the one from last night because I forgot there on okay. Tuesdays. But uh, I did see the first one, and yeah, the guy just seems like he's he's fit, he's ready for the NFL. Right. Like what exactly what you're saying? He, when he was playing in the game, I know his first throw was a back, you know, he's off his back foot and stuff like that. But that's kind of the way he plays. You know, people want to compare him to Manziel and stuff like that. His stat line in this preseason game, I believe, was better than anything Johnny Manziel ever did in any game in the <laughs> NFL. So, I get it. A lot of that was against backups and stuff like that. But we saw Josh Allen's stats weren't as good. Josh Rosen's stats weren't as good. And there's other factors to a lot of that stuff. But he really came out. And it's really interesting why the Browns have these two starting quarterbacks now. Why did they... God, get get Tyrod Taylor when they probably knew they were going to draft a quarterback in this draft. It's very interesting. And Tyrod Taylor, Big Mayfield are, are, are I, at least what I believe. And, and you know, we might be playing the Week One kind of you know game where we're, we're overreacting, but it looks like they have two starting quarterbacks on their team, and exactly. it's going to be weird and very interesting because both guys can play. And it's not like Tyrod Taylor is like the oldest dude either. So 
I, I don't know. This might not be the best thing for the Browns. Uh, not that they've you know done a lot of good things, you know, the last twenty years, but still, I don't know how this is going to work out for them because I just think they have two you know budding heads here. Right. Yeah. Tyrod Taylor just turned twenty nine. I think he's been in the league for like seven or eight years, yeah. which is pretty crazy because I remember watching him at Virginia Tech, uh, mm-hmm. and then Hank, him getting drafted. He was playing in Baltimore and. Uh, everyone was saying he's too short, he, he's like a Michael Vick wannabe, he's not ever going to make it. And guess what? Uh, he doesn't turn the ball over he's right now. Yeah. He, he's not a Tom Brady-esque or an Aaron Rodgers-esque who has the great precision and accuracy. He uses his legs when he needs to, but he prefers to sit back in the pocket. A lot of times when uh, we sit here and say that a team has two quarterbacks, that usually means that they have zero, mm-hmm. right? Because usually there should be a clear-cut guy and then mm-hmm. a number two. Um, in this case, however, I feel that and like we said, we could be over-exaggerating because exactly. it's only been one game, but it, it's looking like the Browns could potentially have two starting quarterbacks, and I think for them, that is a, f- a fantastic thing to have. Um, a lot of times in today's world of sports, when, when a player gets drafted so high like Baker Mayfield did, the expectations are through the roof. He's expecting to start right away. He's expected to perform at a very, very high level, and even if you're playing for the Browns, who's been one of the worst organizations in recent memory... Uh, he's expected to lift that team up and get wins. Guess what? For the From the Browns organization and from their standpoint, I feel that they're like, hey, listen, we brought in Tyrod Taylor so that we don't have to play Baker Mayfield. Let's let him sit, whether it's for a couple games, half the season. You know what? Even if it's for the full season, let him, let him be like Aaron Rodgers and uh, some of these other guys that can sit there and just soak things up and not have to be thrown into the fire. Now, if the Browns uh, you know, start Tyrod Taylor and they go one and four, then maybe you can see a switch. But if they start doing well, if they go 3-1, and one, even 2-2, two and two, I still think they're going to sit Baker Mayfield and say, listen, man, we know that you are the quarterback of the future, but right now we don't necessarily need you. We want you to learn. So um, like I said, in most cases, I, I would be a little hesitant about the whole two-quarterback situation. But here, I think it's a good thing. You have the veteran and Tyrod Taylor who you know what you're going to get from him, right? You, you can expect it day in, day out. Baker Mayfield, sit back, soak things up, be a sponge, and when your name is called, be ready. You know what's funny? I actually feel better. After you explained it that kind of that way, I do feel better about the situation. You're right. I think he should sit back and barring, you know, the Brown season maybe being over earlier than they thought, uh, that's when you bring him in. But I say, man, if they're good, like you're saying with Tyra Taylor, you don't have to play him because why would you? You know what I'm saying? You don't want to ruin the, the you know, you don't want to put dissension between the team. So, uh, I actually feel a lot better about the big Mayfield situation after that. All right, so let's go to the second quarterback that went off the board, Sam Darnold in New York. Now, this is another one where there's two quarterbacks that can start. I think Sam Darnold needs to start, though. This guy, he's the, he was the most ready quarterback coming out, I believed, and he is showing it, and he showed it in his debut. And again, we might be overreacting, but this dude looked like the way he looked at USC. And this, it didn't look like the NFL affected him really at all. No, not at all. And it was funny. Uh, after the game, he's being interviewed. And, and I forget what the exact question was. But um, it, was, it was basically something along the lines of, you know, how have you been handling uh, this NFL experience so far? Is there anything um, that has been, you know, helping you transition to the NFL? And he mentioned that the NFL hash marks. And for those who aren't familiar, um, the hash marks are those lines that are right in the middle of the field. And it's basically... Uh, before a play starts, the ball has to be lined up in between those hash marks. In college football and in high school football, those hash marks are out wider, closer to the sidelines. In the NFL, um, they're, they're closer to the middle of the field, which means there's more field to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, and for Josh, for, I'm sorry, for Sam Darnold, he came out and said the hash marks are helping him uh, read defenses and actually play. So, an interesting note, I've never really heard a quarterback I've say that the hash really, marks yeah. are helping him before, but whatever it takes. I think this is the one situation with the New York Jets where uh, I think Sam Darnold, like you mentioned, needs to start, and I think he has the best opportunity to start out of all the other rookie quarterbacks right now. Um, Josh McCown, Teddy Bridgewater, you know exactly what you're going to get from both of those guys. I think they're both spot starters and what I mean by that is basically their backups uh I think they're journeyman quarterbacks obviously Teddy Bridgewater with the the horrible knee injury the fact that he's been able to come back from that is a miracle in itself uh and I think he should probably be the number two quarterback I don't think he will be I think Josh McCown 
uh, just has a little more veteran experience. Um, but at the end of the day, I think there's no question that Sam Darnold, talent-wise, is the best quarterback. And I feel that if the Jets want to win right now, I think Sam Darnold gives them that best chance. I completely agree. And I think Bridgewater, the reason they have him, is more to have a, a backup for the future, in a way. Uh, because McCown, McCown is older. He's going to you know, not be there for the longest time. So you want that Bridgewater, uh, that Bridgewater bridge. In between, <laughs> uh, in between Sam Darnold. But I have to agree with you. Uh, like I just mentioned, he's got to start. This is not a Baker Tyrod situation. This is a Sam Darnold needs to start situation. And he's he's good. The Jets have not really had a solid quarterback since Mark Sanchez. And you could say that was probably the, the reason they got to the AFC Championship game that year was because of their defense, not necessarily Mark Sanchez. So this is this is their first quarterback in a while that I can say, hey man, the Jets have a solid quarterback here. And barring major injuries. It looks like the Jets have a quarterback. Now you just build around the guy. Right. And the one thing I will say uh, about this team overall, yes, I do feel that Sam Darnold needs to start. I can also see him struggling a little bit, and not necessarily because of him and his talent, but because of the lack of talent around him. Exactly. I don't feel that yeah. the Jets have the receiving core. Um, they have a decent running back. They have a running back tandem with Isaiah Correll and uh, Bilal Pau. I think that's a, a nice one-two punch. Nothing to write home about. But I think they're going to have to lean on the running game because I don't see any receiving or tight end threats no, I agree. that Sam Darnold can say, listen, on third and six, this is my guy. This is who I'm going to go to. So I can see him struggling a little bit, but I think it will be more of the lack of talent as opposed to you know Sam Darnold making the transition. I think he's ready uh, and set to go. But so you know, if the Jets come out and struggle a little bit, I'm not going to sit here and panic and say, oh my gosh, Sam Darnold doesn't have it. I think the Jets over the next couple of years need to build pieces around, and then uh, you know hopefully see them prosper from there. Totally, uh, totally agree. Uh, all right, so let's mix this up a little bit. Let's get into a running back, Saquon Barkley. We talked a little bit about him earlier. Big run in the beginning. He also kind of strained his hamstring the other day, uh, but it's, they say it's nothing serious. Um, from what I saw from Barkley, seems like the real deal. You know, when you look at running backs in the NFL, you look at Ezekiel Elliott. You look at uh, Le'Veon Bell, Todd Gurley, David Johnson. And I think, barring injuries, like I've said with a lot of guys, Saquon Barkley is that fifth guy, that fifth really, really good running back. You know, I, I compare it, it's, a, it's probably a dumb comparison, but when you look at the guys that are really good in fantasy football, those are the guys that tend to be the top running backs in the league, too. Other, other positions, you can kind of, you know, you can rate guys differently through fantasy football, but I think when you look at a running back, uh, these five guys are just, they seem like legit. And the way he cut and burst through the hole on that big run you're talking about, it looked like an NFL running back. It didn't look like a college running back transitioning. It looked like an NFL running back. So I think he's going to be the real deal. And I think New York, the New York Giants are going to be a pretty good team this year. They will. And, and I don't want you know people to sit here and kind of jump up in arms when I say this. But from that first run, with the hesitation and everything, yeah. he reminded me of Le'Veon Bell. Exactly. Because he was exactly. he was composed. He was willing to wait for the hole to open. He wasn't just happy feet. Oh my gosh, it's my first carry. I got to make something happen. He was willing to wait for that hole to open. He made a cutback, made two defenders miss him, and then he was able to beat the safety, get up to the sideline, and, and like we said, scamper for that third nine yard run. Um, his next three runs, he only carried. Uh, he only gained three yards. So. It was, you know, obviously one big run, and then the, the Browns the defense, though. right, you right, the and that's really what it's about. So, uh, I'm I'm going to continue to say this. I think he is a fantastic running back. I think he's going to be a fantastic running back, uh, and uh, obviously he's going to help this Giants offense uh, significantly because they haven't had a running back of this caliber since, uh, you know, the days of Rondé Barber or you know Tiki, Tiki, Tiki Barber. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Tiki Barber. Rondé Barber is the twin brother, yeah, exactly. right? Uh, Tiki Barber, and I think Saquon Barkley is better than Tiki Barber is in general. Uh, but I will continue to say this. If you are the Giants, um, with the amount of talent and, and you know rookie quarterback talent that came out this year, if, if all these rookies end up panning out, I think the Giants are still going to be slapping themselves. Because Eli Manning, when he retires in a year or two, what are the Giants going to do, right? I, it's, it's a lot easier, in my opinion, to go and find a running back as it is to oppose to a quarterback. So, Saquon Barkley, hopefully he pans out and hopefully he does very, very well. But... I think the, the bigger picture for the Giants was to find a the quarterback of the future, which I don't think they did, because right now uh, David Webb is their backup. And David Webb has been a quarterback slash receiver in the NFL, which tells you all you need to know about him. Wow. Teams are not sure what he is. 
Yeah, you know what's interesting about it, too? And Odell's going to get paid soon. He better. He's going to get paid. And he's going to be the highest paid wide receiver. Then you, So that means you're going to lose money out on potentially going out in free agency and getting a big quarterback, too. Right. Because you're going to eventually probably pay Saquon Barkley after his... So it's just... Yeah, you're right about this. Is that maybe... You know, it probably looks great. Oh, there's another Le'Veon Bell, Antonio Brown tandem, in a way, with Odell and Saquon Barkley. That could happen. But they have Big Ben. Right. They don't have Davis Webb. So I agree with you. They need to draft a guy this year. It's almost like a lot of what people were saying with the Cardinals and stuff like that. They just need to draft a quarterback. They finally did. The Giants, they're that team now. They're the team that needs to draft a quarterback. Eli, it's not that he's a great quarterback right now. They could win a Super Bowl this year with Eli Manning. We've seen it happen twice with him. But he's old. There's going to come a year where he just gets hurt and can't play anymore. So I agree with you. Uh, maybe they shouldn't have drafted Saquon Bolicki, but they have him for this year, and if you're a Giants fan, you should be happy, and if you're Jared, I'm sure you're not happy about that. No, listen, he's going to do great. He's going to go to multiple Pro Bowls. He's going to lead his, help lead his team to victories. I mean, on paper, this Giants team should be very, very good. Two years ago, they were in the top five ranked defense. Yeah. Uh, last year, they kind of sputtered, and, and who knows Something what happened, happened, but <laughs> they basically have the same nucleus and the same guys coming back on defense, so their defense should be pretty good. Offensively, you have Eli Manning, two-time Super Bowl champion, right? You bring in, Sa- or you bring in uh, Saquon Barkley. Mm-hmm. You got Odell Beckham Jr., Sterling Shepard out there, right? I mean, on, on paper, yeah. this team looks pretty loaded, but we said the same thing last year about this team, and they underachieved horribly. So new coaching staff, new scheme coming in. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with them. They should be a good team. Second Barkley should be a big piece, uh, but we will see. All right, uh, let's move on. I'm going to put these two next quarterbacks combined. I'm just running a little uh, low on time for the segment. Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, uh, we'll mix the Joshes. What did you see from those two guys in their debut? Uh, I'm going to let you take Josh Rosen because okay, I was not able to see that Cardinals game. Totally, totally. Josh Allen, to me, um, I feel that he has probably the biggest upside of all these rookie quarterbacks. But right now, I don't know if he's ready to start. Arm, but like they have no quarterbacks. Though. They, they, they don't. They have AJ McCarron, um, and I don't even know who the other quarterback is. Uh, Nathan Peterman, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. the guy who threw five interceptions last year in, in one like, game. In, like, uh, one possession. Right, so. right. So, yeah, I mean, he probably will start just because of the lack of quarterback depth behind him uh, or in front of him, whichever you'd like to say. But uh, the one thing that I came away with, and it's, mm-hmm. this is not any breaking news, is his arm strength. I mean, it doesn't matter if the guy is falling on his back, if he's able to step into a throw, if he's running left to right. He can literally throw the ball you know, 80 yards on his knees. His arm strength is unbelievable. Um, I'm just very curious to see how quickly he's able to pick up an NFL offense, read defenses. Uh, you know, good. luckily for him, he has LaShawn McCoy in the backfield. Um, he's got Kelvin Benjamin, a huge receiving target right there. Uh, so he, he has some pieces around him. Um, we'll see if the, what the offensive line can do because that's a little shaky for the Bills. Uh, so I think he will start, but I'm... I don't know how well the Bills are going to do. I, I think this is a situation where they're still a couple years away. Um, and even, you know, whether he starts or whether Nathan Peterman uh, or AJ McCarron starts, I just don't think the Bills are a good enough team to really do anything. Um, so unfortunately for him, I think it's a, another case of like Sam Darnold, the pieces around him won't be good enough to get wins in the NFL, at least in their first season. Yeah, it, it, Josh Allen, the, the Bills are risking um, ruining him a little bit, I think. I think you make great points about the uh, the fact that there really is not a lot of talent. That, it sucks for that fan base because they were in the playoffs last year. So you hate to see that happen the next year where your team's kind of torn apart. But, you know, that, you got to pay a quarterback or you got to hope that the, the rookie you draft can uh, play right away. But you also got to put talent around him. And... Uh, We'll see what happens with LaShawn McCoy and stuff like that because he has some legal stuff that might happen to him. Calvin Benjamin has really not been the star receiver he was in his first year uh, since his knee injury and stuff like that. So we will see. I agree with you. Uh, Josh Rosen for the Cardinals. Uh, it was a very. It, it's hard to rate how he played because there was a, he was pressured. I believe there was a stat he was pressured on like every play but three of them. Really? Like really, really pressured. And I, I, when I was watching, I saw it. And um, about half the snaps were in the dirt, too. The the, the, the backup center is the Cardinals are dealing with a, a center issue because their starting center, A.Q. Shipley, tore his ACL uh, while we were while we were on, on break. 
And so they're dealing with, a, with, with, with some backups that they don't really know uh, can play center. It's guards they are transitioning. So a lot of times Rosen's picking up the ball, and you're supposed to be really reading your progressions, and he's having to worry about picking up the snap. So he did make some great throws. Uh, some of the receivers weren't paying attention, and they, they didn't run good routes. But there were some flashes of, of brilliance from Josh Rosen. But it, it's a little too hard to rate. He's definitely not going to be the starter. I believe Sam Bradford's going to be the starter for the Cardinals. Um, and Rosen's even said it. He kind of got humbled a little bit in training camp. He, he realized, man, this Sam Bradford guy is, is better than me right now. And so I think that you know, he, the, the attitude he came with with all, the, all these nine guys I'm going to play better, well, I think he got humbled a little bit. I think he's, he's willing to be the backup for now. Uh, and, but we'll see. And I heard he's going to be get a lot more first-team reps, and he'll get more first-team reps in the next preseason game as well. So probably talk about Rosen a little more on the, on the next podcast because uh, not too much from him, and just the, the factors that, that were against him weren't really his fault. So uh, we're going to go to break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about the, uh, the MLB. Uh, we got some news to talk about, some injuries, uh, and the overall playoff race because it's getting a little crazy in the NL. So we will be right back with some baseball talk. Base hit to center. Hernandez has a cannon. Belt headed for the plate. Here's the throw. It's off Grandal's glove. They get the out on Slater. But they've taken the lead on Hanson's second RBI hit of the night. Would have had a shot if Grandall had held on. In the air. Deep right. At the wall. He's done it again. Matt Carpenter. Home run number 32. Four nothing St. Louis. He smokes this down by the pole left field. And this game is tough. His 14th, then he'll be staying at the top of the order for a while, it looks like. Cover 2 Podcast back here on the show with some MLB talk, like Nick mentioned before we went to break. Uh, the MLB is getting a little bit closer to the end of the regular season. We've still got, uh, I would say, what, about a month, month and a half, half. Yeah, month yeah. and a half to go. But uh, we're starting to see you know, where teams are going to be shaping up. Um, you've obviously got the, the cream of the crop, uh, the Boston Red Sox, let's say, for example, Dominating. are clearly pulling yeah. away. The Yankees right now have a lot of injuries, even though they're still in the hunt. Uh, you got the Astros, uh, the Oakland Athletics. I mean, just surpri- surprising. Where the hell did they come right, from? Right, where yeah. did they come from? Uh, and then over in the NL, you got the Cubs, uh, another surprising team, the Braves, who we've talked about, another super young team. Still up, still right? up. Right, uh, the Milwaukee Brewers, uh, Philadelphia Phillies, another surprising team. So I think a lot of uh, surprises, I, to say the least, that maybe we didn't necessarily expect at the beginning of the year. Um, you know, we have the Dodgers with a lot of injuries. Kenley Jansen, like you just mentioned off air, is injured. So, Nick, I just want to get your thoughts right now on the playoff race as it stands today and if you think things will change once we get into the, the start of the Well, playoffs. it's a lot more interesting than, let's say, it was the last time we talked about the playoff races. Uh, you have the Cardinals up there, because Matt Carpenter has been on absolute tear, leading the NL in home runs with 32. Matt Carpenter leading the NL in home runs. It's insane. They're about one game out of the wild card. Uh, Milwaukee's still up there. Uh, the, NL, the NL playoffs is a lot better, because... Um, with the AL, you have the Indians, who kind of dominate their division. You have the Red Sox, who are somehow dominating their division of the Yankees. Uh, you have the Yankees, who are going to make the playoffs. It's just, it's just you know, they're going to be in that wild card game more than likely. And then uh, the AL West is interesting. Houston is the, up there. Uh, the Ast- or, excuse me, uh, the Athletics are up there. And Seattle, that's the best race in the AL to watch. But there's pretty much, um, you know... Two teams fighting, or right, two or three teams fighting for that last wild card, and they're all in the same division. So some of them are, you know, one of them's going to make playoffs. Just one of those teams is not. So not as interesting. The NL, you have the NL West, which is insane right now. You have the Giants, you have Dodgers, Rockies, Diamondbacks, all still have a chance, a legit chance in the NL West. Diamondbacks, uh, not taking it away, but the Dodgers have not been winning because they have the injury to Jansen. The bullpen is blowing it. They really do need Kenley Jansen. Uh, in the Central, like I mentioned, you have the Cubs, and you have Milwaukee and St. Louis, who are right behind them. They could still win the division, too, and one of those teams 
probably will make the wild card in the East. You still have the Phillies, the Braves, and of course the Nationals. I'll say this right now. I don't think the Nationals are going to make the playoffs. No, I could have told you that I mean, two, it's two just, weeks ago. It's just, but you expect them. I, I remember I said it, whenever we talked about this last time, I said, you know, they'll probably come back. I don't think so anymore. The Braves are too good. The Phillies are staying staying there. And all these other wild card teams, like St. Louis came out, kind of came out of nowhere. You have Milwaukee. Are the Dodgers really not going to make the playoffs too? It, it's, it's, it's crazy. I just, you know, it's weird. And I think we talked about this last time with Harper and all that stuff. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what the hell happens in Washington because I don't think they're going to make playoffs. This no, year. I don't either. And, and you know, Washington must feel very strongly about re-signing Harper because, like we like we've mentioned before, and I just have to reiterate it again. Um, I don't see how they make the playoffs this year. Even it's, the, their playoff hopes aren't dead, but they're no. six games out of the wild card right now. Yeah, all that's right. Terrible. And I just I don't know if they have enough firepower to get themselves back in the hump. Now, obviously, they could go on a big streak. Um, but going back to Bryce Harper, I, I mean, they must, they must feel very, very strongly that they're going to get him back because if you feel, if you don't get him back now, you're going to lose him for nothing. Right. To where at least you there's no, there's no compensation. Right. And, yeah. um, that goes both ways as well. Other teams know, uh, and, and knew that they weren't going to offer up a bunch. So the Washington probably felt like we're getting, you know, skimped here and we're not going to get the full value that we'll get in return. Which is another reason why they probably kept Bryce Harper, uh, along with you know we still have a fighting chance to get into the wild card. So a lot of different variables there. But no, I just I don't see this Washington Nationals team right now. Just looking at the schedule uh, and the, the standings, I don't see how they're going to do it. Uh, I think the Brewers, the Phillies, the Cardinals, the the Rockies, and the Dodgers, if they can get you know some some pitching help, because right now I it, I feel like I'm talking about the Angels when I'm talking about the Dodgers. The pitching. Uh, has yeah. not been good. But the starters been... have been solid, and Kershaw has been really, really good lately. The bullpen is just its horrendous. It's not good. And Jansen is out until probably September with a heart issue. He says he's probably going to have to have open heart surgery in the wow. offseason. But he wants to come back and play. I mean, Jansen is kind of one of the faces of the Dodgers in a way. He's got the, he comes out to California love. It's almost like a a wrestler entrance when he comes in and stuff like that. The fans love him. He's a big personality. And he's a big dude in that big personality too. And he's just that cog. He's one of the best closers in the game. And they didn't have anybody before him. And now they're having like Kente Mieta try to close out games. It's just, it's it's not going to work. They need, number one, they should try to trade for a reliever. But that's hard because they can kind of get easily claimed on waivers. The way the trade deadline works and stuff like that after the actual trade deadline. Uh, and... It's just, it's going to suck. Jansen will probably come back this year, but will it be too late? I don't know. I mean, Dodgers definitely have enough offense, but you're right. The pitching is uh, is not there for them right now. Right, right. So I think what needs to happen for the Dodgers is their starting pitchers need to go a little bit longer. Yeah. And, you know, they need to be able to pitch minimum six innings, uh, try to be able to go seven, maybe even eight to take some of the pressure off of the bullpen because... If the Dodgers starters are only able to go, let's say, five innings or something like that, that's a solid, you know, four whole innings that you can need to bring the relievers in. And right now they're not doing well. So uh, I think obviously Kershaw, you know, that's a guy that can go seven, eight, even nine innings. And he seems like he's like on. Right, right. Now. right. Yeah. And, and I think he understands that whether he's had a talk with the manager or I'm sure he's just smart enough to realize that, hey, listen, we don't have time. I, I need to go at least seven, eight innings, right? I can't mm -hmm. sit here. Uh, you know, give up a bunch of runs and only go five and then rely on our bullpen who just doesn't have it right now. So, uh, yeah, this Dodgers team, like we, we mentioned, I mean, a couple months ago, they were waiting for guys to come back from injury. You've got Turner that's finally coming back, right? And it's like, do the Dodgers make trades during the deadline or do they wait and hope that their own guys can come back from injury? Uh, it seems like, you know, obviously they got Machado, uh, uh, but for the most part, I think they're waiting on guys to come back. Um, we'll see if that comes back to bite them, though. Yeah, you got uh, Hanjin Ryu coming back soon. Uh, Julio Urias, who has been out for essentially two years with a shoulder injury, he's coming back. He could, he's definitely going to be bullpen help. Urias is not, even though he was a starter when he was younger, uh, and he still is young. He's only 21. It seems like this guy's been around for a long time because he has. He was drafted when he was 15. And so uh, they'll get him back. He'll help in the bullpen. He'll kind of be one of those really good, solid lefty, uh, lefty arms, and obviously he can go extended innings. But you need Jansen back, uh, or you need to figure out some way to maybe get one of these like expensive relievers so he doesn't get claimed off waivers. Um, in the West, I'll ask you this, Jared. 
What do you think is going to happen in the NL West, though? Because the Diamondbacks are really, a really solid team. The Rockies, we know, uh, made the playoffs last year. The Giants, we know their playoff pedigree. They're going to be in it for the long haul. They have Madison Bumgarner back. He's going to be, uh, you know, he's going to be back. They did lose Cueto to Tommy John surgery, um, so he'll be out for you know a very long time. What do you think is going to happen in this NL West? Uh, I'm going to go with the Diamondbacks and the Dodgers okay. to to actually get in. Yeah. Um, the Rockies, yes, they, they've had a, a very, very good year. And right now, they're one game behind the Diamondbacks, who sit atop yeah. the NL West. Um, but I feel on paper and just my gut feeling is that if the Dodgers get healthy enough, oh, yeah. they have a, a way better roster than the Rockies do. Now, the Rockies at home, it's a, it's a very good ballpark for hitters. Uh, you know, you can hit a lot of home runs, that type of thing. Um, but if the Rockies don't get home field advantage... Um, I, I don't see them making a whole lot of noise. Yeah. And so I think they would have to win the division for them to oh, get into the playoffs. Yeah. And if they don't win the division, I don't see them getting in uh, by the wild card. So you're so, yeah, it, no, it's going to be interesting. Um, can you pull up the wild card standings? Because I don't know exactly the NL wild card standings right now. And I want to see where the Rockies are. So right now, the Rockies are fourth. Okay, that so makes sense exactly where but, but guess what? They're only a game and a half behind the Brewers who sit atop the wild card. So they're very much alive. Yeah. I just think that for them um, and their style of play, I think that they need to win the division, get home field advantage. I think that would give them a much better chance as opposed to having to go on the road uh, and win that way. Yeah, no, I, it's it's going to be close. Uh, I think we talk about the Nationals in the way of their, their roster was so good that we thought they would you know, eventually step up. The Dodgers roster is way better than the Nationals. This is just, I mean, the last couple games, if they would have had Kenley Jansen, barring Kenley Jansen blowing four saves in a row, the Dodgers would be in first place in the NL West. Right. Like, it's, so it, it's, it's literally a, from, from the last week or two, the Dodgers have not played well. That's why they're down. But they do need to fix the bullpen because that is a problem. And once you get the playoffs, too, you have to have bullpen. I mean, we saw that with the Dodgers last year. Their bullpen was better. They had Brandon Morrow, they had Kevin Jansen, and they got all the way to Game 7 of the World Series. Uh, so you need that as well. And you you know when the race is this crazy in, in the NL, you need that as well for the regular season. They, they, they started off so terribly that they now have to catch up. Uh, but I agree with you. I think it's going to be Diamondbacks and Dodgers that get out of the NL West. Uh, right. I, I want to ask you as the resident Dodgers fan on yes. this show, and this is personally a Dodgers fan, um, how do you feel about them as compared to last year? I know last year they went on that huge winning streak. They seem to be a little bit healthier. This year, uh, the bullpen definitely isn't as good no, not. Right, as advertised. Um, do you feel as strongly as you did last year about the team? Do you think that um, all they need to do is make the playoffs and then they have a, a solid chance to get to the World Series? Or does this team, do they not have that same juice and feel? Well, I definitely, year? it worked out perfectly for the Dodgers because they had, obviously they were like 45 and 8. And then they lost like 11 in a row, and they went into the playoffs awfully calm, which you kind of want to do. You don't want to be too hot like the Indians last year, who were, were hot going into September. They won like 57 games in a row, it seemed like, and then they went into the playoffs, and they got swept, and Kluber wasn't the same. So, I, you know, everything worked out for them last year. I would say I'm feeling about even um, about their chances, only because the lineup is better. They got Dozier, they got Machado, and, and and some of the other players like Jock Peterson are playing better than they did last year. So it's about even though I'm definitely not as confident with the pitching because they don't have a clear number two. Uh, you Darvis played well until the World Series, and the bullpen is not nearly the same. And if Jansen isn't on the Dodgers roster for the rest of the season, they might not make the playoffs. So uh, I'll say this. I, I feel about the same about them as a, a, a biased fan, but if they don't get bullpen help, I'm definitely not as confident as I was, uh, as I was last year. Right, right. And yeah. this is just myself as a gut feeling regarding Kenley Jansen. Um, when you're talking about having potentially to have open heart surgery yeah. in the offseason, I, I don't understand how the medical staff and people would let him come back and play knowing that he would potentially have to have this type of surgery. It's not like, well, oh, well you know what? You might just have to have like a you know, an ankle touch-up or something in the offseason. Like, this is open heart surgery. I don't I don't know how he comes back and plays. Well, I think it was an irregular heartbeat, which is why he went to the hospital. And then I think they just... I've seen guys come back from this before. And I think what Jansen's saying is that 
I'm just going to get this fixed. I'm not going to try to play through this after the season. I can play through it. I'm not going to like die on the field. Uh, you never know, obviously. But I think if the medical staff does clear him, they obviously know he can play. I think it, I would compare it to playing like on a torn ACL and just saying, you know what, I can play on it. I can deal with it. I can step certain ways. But I'm going to get this fixed in the offseason. So I agree with you. It is weird. Whenever you hear heart, you feel like that guy's out for like two years. Right. You know, but I think this wasn't like uh, he passed out or anything. It was an irregular heartbeat. So um, I don't know anything about uh, science or medical stuff. So I'm sitting here uh, kind of being blasphemous about this. But uh, I think I think he'll be fine. And I think he'll, he'll you know, obviously you don't want anything to happen to him in the open heart surgery. But, you know, it's for the win. He's getting paid a lot. So right, I'm right. just kidding. It's, it's so interesting. I'm looking at these the standings right now. And I know you mentioned it at the beginning of the podcast. But it's just like, or at the beginning of this segment. But it's like, in the NL, there's literally eight teams that still have a chance yeah. to make the ball. Well, great. how far are the Giants back? And in the AL, there's only three. It's so bad. Uh, the Giants right now are uh, seventh. Uh, well, how many games back, though? Uh, five and a half. Because it's not that bad, but they're probably out of it. Are they ahead yeah, they, they, of the Nationals? They are. Wow. By, by a half a well, game. They, they, half a they game. don't have Samarja or Cueto, and they right. still have... Yeah, it's, that's terrible. Nationals yeah. ain't making the playoffs. I, now, that just made... If the Giants still have a chance, better chance than the Nationals, Nationals have no chance. No. So the Giants probably are not, but they're they're beating the Dodgers, so it's kind of looking like they... You know, but... Yeah, like that's two, fair. Two to one win against the Dodgers last night. Exactly, yeah. And uh, that was... The bullpen blew it again in the ninth. So, I, I swear to God, it's, it's been like four days in a row. You watch the highlights, and it's like, oh... You know, Kershaw win eight innings, struck out ten guys. They won. Nope, they lost because the guy gave up a. You know, and maybe maybe so. the Dodgers do what other teams are doing and, and bring in some of their oh, uh, no infield way. guys to pitch. You know, I, I feel that this year that we have to. They, they have to Kike, be like, Kike gave him a walk off home run. There has to be a record for like the most um, non pitchers pitching. I don't know what the right word is. You know, in uh, yeah, right? position players, Posi- yeah. right? Uh, position players actually having to come on come on and pitch this year. I feel like. At least once, I mean, we've we've heard so much about it from different teams. I don't yes. know. I feel it whether it's through injuries, um, games being extended longer and going 15, 16 innings, and you're literally running out of pitching. I don't know what it is, uh, but I think we've had a lot of position players having to come on and pitch, uh, and I think it's been interesting. Obviously, it hasn't all been good. I remember Jose Reyes uh, came oh, on and yeah. for them, and it was just ugly. He gave up a home run. I mean, you know, he's pitching like 60, 70 miles an hour, and obviously that's. <laughs> That's like T ball. Well, the Dodgers, the Dodgers faced uh, position player Hernan Perez twice this year. Wow. They did, yeah. It, they, the Dodgers beat the tar out of Milwaukee a couple weeks ago. And uh, he came in and gave up like six more runs. <laughs> like it was like not, he made it worse. So oh, that, you know, it, it, it is, I think it is a record this year. It's getting, at least getting close. Um, it's just part of the game, but yeah, I get. Maybe they should, you know, maybe the Dodgers should try to start a bullpen guy like the Rays have been. Maybe that's what they should do, right? And then bring in Kershaw. Well, you'd let Kershaw do what he can do because obviously he can do it, but maybe these other starters because they've been so so. You bring in like these bullpen guys and, and you go, hey, you guys obviously can't close out games, so try to start them. You know what I'm saying? Like that. And when, then they, you know. When do the rosters expand? September. September, September. 1st. Okay, yeah. so I think a lot of teams right now, including the Dodgers and teams that are banged up, are like, you know, praying yes, for that day please, to come yes, yes. so they can get some help. And and do you think the Dodgers maybe go uh, to like a, a six man rotation? Do you think they what what is their? I don't uh, think the ro- the rotation isn't necessarily the problem. It's literally just closing out games. It's that eighth and ninth inning. I mean, Walker Bueller the other day, the rookie for them this year, literally, I think he was the first uh, road guy ever, or at least the first road pitcher in a long, long time. To go six scoreless innings in Colorado. Wow. And they blew that game too. So he actually went seven, I think he went seven um, shutout innings in Colorado. So these guys, these pitchers for the Dodgers, some of them are doing what they're, they're supposed to do. Kershaw last night. Uh, or when I, no, 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 he didn't pitch last night. He pitched the night before. Uh, even yesterday, it's a 2 1 game. Obviously, the starter didn't do bad. You know what I'm saying? It's a 2 1 game. So. I don't think it's necessarily a rotation thing with the Dodgers. They might have to go to six-man just because they have so many starters and Ryu's going to come back. But 
I, I agree with you. They're, they're going to be one of these teams that really, really hopes that they get these guys uh, uh, you know, up when the September roster is done, especially these, some of these bullpen guys. Right. And what's the, uh, what's the expansion number? Like right now it's 25 oh, you, know, you can go to the full 40. Oh, really? Yeah, you can get to, most teams usually don't do that. Uh, you, the Dodgers a lot of times have like 33, 34 guys. Okay. So but, there's a good seven to eight guys. Oh, that yeah. You can, but you can have 15 extras. Wow. So, you know, you, this, that's, where, that's where you try out the, uh, the base stealer for the playoffs, all that stuff. You bring those kind of guys up. Um, but, all right. So I want to talk about this before the segment's over, too. The NL MVP race. Uh, the AL, you look at it like the playoffs. It's, you know, probably going to be like Mookie Betts or J.D. Martinez or Mike Trout. One of those guys will probably win it. Who in the NL do you think is going to win MVP? Because I have no freaking idea. I, it's a... Uh... It's a toss up. It, no, I mean, it really is. It's, like when you when you when you stand back and look at it, you would think it would be a uh, Bryce Harper esque, right? Yeah, but yeah. obviously he has had one of the biggest roller coaster up and down seasons of his career and just doesn't look like the Bryce Harper that we know. Mm-hmm. Um so really I I don't know. It's a it's a toss up. It's a yeah, there's no shoot. Stanton either. Stanton won it last year, but right. he's not in And league. now he's yeah. in the AO with the Yankees. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to you the baseball. I have one guy. It, I talked about him earlier, Matt Carpenter, 32 home runs. Uh, I believe he hit home runs in six straight days earlier this season too. Uh, the guy is willing the St. Louis Cardinals uh, to a playoff berth or a potential playoff berth. I believe they're one game out of the wild card right now. So my leader in the clubhouse is Matt Carpenter, just because his stats are so good, he could easily get to 40 home runs this year. And he's been he's leading his team. He looks like an MVP. Uh, I'm not going to give it to a guy like Arenado just because he plays in Colorado. It's tough to give a guy like that. Right. Goldschmidt, who's also usually an MVP candidate, uh, had such a terrible start to the season that I think it's kind of hard to give him that as well. But is Zeus Aguilar? Maybe he's kind of falling 20, off a little bit home too. Runs. There's nobody on the Dodgers really that that, that should get it either. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with Carpenter right now. I think, and you could also go with the Braves, maybe a Freddie Freeman, uh, as well, because he's kind of been unsung. Uh, I don't think there's a pitcher this year that's gonna get it. Uh, you could give it to, you could possibly give it to Jacob Degrom, because Degrom still has an ERA below two. But I'm gonna go with Matt Carpenter. The guy's willing his team uh, to a, to a potential playoff berth, and he's just out playing out of his mind right now. Maybe he won't play as well come September, but. In August, he's been the best player in the world. So, I'm going to go with him. Uh, uh, but, yeah, it's very interesting. It, 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 the NL is just crazy. If you like baseball, watch NL baseball. Because nobody knows who the MVP is going to be. And nobody really knows who's going to make those wild card bursts. You could probably figure out who might win the division. But, yeah, it, it, it's crazy right now. Yeah, you got eight teams who are technically still alive crazy. in the NL wild card. Um, here's another thing I want to talk about. And this is more local. Rumors came out that Mike Sosha uh, might retire at the end of the season. He came out and said that's completely bogus. His contract is up at the end of the season. What do you think is going to happen with Mike Sosha? What do I think is going to happen? Yes. yes, yes, yes. Uh, as opposed to what I want to happen. I want to. Those I, are two I, different well, okay. questions. You can answer both then. Okay. What do you think is going to happen to Mike Sosha? And what does Jared Smith want to the Angels to do with Mike Sosha? I feel that Mike Sosha basically controls his own destiny. I feel that he has he such that a long. Yeah, I do. I feel that he has uh, such a long tenure with the organization, uh, and even though he won a World Series back in two thousand two when I was twelve years old, uh, I think that's just bought him so much time. So, I think if he wants to stay on as manager and uh, renew his contract, I think that's what's going to happen. Um, I think what he will do, and I think the smart thing, just like what many players do is I think he's going to kind of sit back and see if any other team comes out and, and throws any offers or has any interest in him. Mm. And then I think he might you know, kind of go from there. If he doesn't have much interest, I think he stays. Uh, if he does get some interest and it's a team that he has you know, had his eye on, then I could see him potentially leaving. Now what I want to happen, I, I want him gone. <laughs> and, and it's not you know, anything other than uh, strictly baseball and strictly the fact that the Angels just have not been relevant and I think they need a new voice uh, you know to, to be their manager it's I think he's he's a great guy and he's a good manager but I think at a certain point 
when this team has has gone so many years without it's, it's been one playoff berth in the last like seven or eight years. Right. So. That that to me is terms for firing. Right. Yeah. If this you don't get second, like third, fourth, failure. fifth, yeah. sixth chances when you have the Mike Trout and when you have you you get Justin Upton and um you know what I mean like like yes this team needs totally better agree. pitching yeah. and you can't sit here and it's not Mike Sosha's fault that the pitching has been horrible because of injury but also uh, you have to look at the upper management for not signing players or you know only wanting to sign um, Josh Hamilton's and and you know listen oh we'll sign and, you to a 125 million dollar contract because you're going to put you know butts in the seats right as opposed to going out and getting pitching what this team really needs um, so I think it's been a combination of a lot of factors but at the end of the day uh, I feel that that locker room just needs a new voice and I think it's time for a new manager to step in and see if they can change things up a little bit uh, and hopefully management can as well so we'll see at the end of the day um, like I said I think he probably will stay because I, he does control his own destiny um, but for the Angels sake yes. I hope they get a new voice I have to disagree with that you that he controls his own destiny though I think he's gone no matter what at the end of the season I don't necessarily I don't I don't necessarily want him gone because I think he's the best coach that the Angels could sign next year but I think you're right about the um, the culture they, they just need like a new voice it's not an indictment against social social could get a job anywhere else. You know, you're going to see people get fired probably at the end of the season, and Mike Sosha is going to be probably number one on that list to potentially go over there and, and be a coach. Or he could be a bench coach somewhere or something like that. But I think you're right. And I think to just give Mike Sosha some credit, you, uh, if you've seen the coaches that have come out from under his ranks as well, that shows how good of a coach he's been for a while. Joe Madden, for example, uh, Buddy Black, uh, Ron Renneke. These guys were all on the Angels staff just as coaches. And now they're out there, and, and they're some of the best managers in the league. So, uh, no indictment on social, but I, I agree with you. There just needs to be a new voice for the Angels. And uh, he's been a great manager. I agree with you. Upper management hasn't given him the best stuff, and I think they have been uh, kind of money chasing the last couple of years with the 600 home runs for Pujols and, and Josh Hamilton and C.J. Wilson and all these, you know what I'm saying, and all these guys. So, uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what they do because it'll be very, very new uh, for us fans here in Orange County, but I think you're right. I think there needs to be a new voice, and uh, and good old Mike Social probably needs to go. And probably I I disagree. I think he just will go this season. I think Artie Marino will not have him back. Uh, we need to go break. On the other side of this break, we're going to be doing another edition of Do You Care? This is Cover Two Podcast on OC Rock. Radio. Maryland has placed head football coach DJ Durkin on leave as the school continues their investigation into the death of Terrapin offensive lineman Jordan McNair. The 19-year-old collapsed during a May 29th team workout. McNair was hospitalized and died two weeks later. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Puig and Hundley coming together. Hundley shoves him. Puig returns the ball and the bench is clear. The contract of Clippers commentator and our former colleague Bruce Bowen was not renewed by Fox Sports West because of recent public comments he made about Kawhi Leonard, a person with knowledge of the situation confirmed. Bowen, who obviously won three titles with the Spurs, was highly critical of the way Leonard handled his Spurs situation back in June. The Clippers are projected to have $40 million in cap space next season. Welcome back to the Cover 2 podcast. Once again, I'm Nick Nina. And I'm Jared Smith. And, uh, and Jerry, do you know what time it is right now? What time is it, Nick? It's time for Do You Care? It's time for Do You Care? That sound you heard was me uh, cracking a water bottle because I couldn't think of anything else to do and I wanted to get creative. So I was going to cough, and, but I thought that was kind of unsanitary. Unsan so yeah, I did that instead. Exactly. Uh, so Do You Care? If you don't know how we play this game, it's uh, we ask each other whether we care about the topic. It's that easy. And we go back and forth. And we got some good ones. Some of these are more funny and, and not as serious, so it's our, it's our time to kind of get silly on the podcast. But there are some serious ones. Uh, Jared, like usual, you get the first question. Do you care that Jalen Ramsey has been uh, a shooting off on Twitter? No, I don't care. Uh, first of all, Jalen Ramsey, along with Dante Fowler Jr., uh, two Jaguars players, are suspended for a week for some sort of team violation. We don't necessarily know what. But what we do know is that Jalen Ramsey, uh, it doesn't mean that he's not going to keep mouthing off. That's what he does. That's his yeah. MO. 
Uh, it's just a part of the football player that he is, and he went off on uh, some rookie quarterbacks and some veterans. Uh, he went off on Josh Allen, saying that he's garbage. Went off on Matt Ryan, saying that he's overrated. Uh, I don't know what caused him to say this. I don't know if he was just upset Did they that he face, got suspended. Did the Jaguars face the Bills? That There's no way he could say I the guy's trash. I don't played. know. I'm not exactly sure why. He also came out and said that Blake Bortles was underutilized last season. So I'm assuming that he has a problem with the Jaguars organization right now for suspending him. And maybe he's just taking it out and just lashing out. And the media was right there to hear it all. So uh, I don't really care. To me, it's kind of a non-story. The Jaguars aren't going to suspend Jalen Ramsey for a regular season game because of course, he's of one course. of the best corners yeah. in the league. So it's preseason. It's not like he needs the, all the work anyway. We know what an all-pro player he is. So, uh, yeah, it's preseason. Who really cares? Not a big deal. Nick, do you care? Speaking uh, of uh, football here, uh, do you care that the Maryland football program is in major trouble? Uh, yes, I do care uh, because uh, my brother plays football. And it's the summertime. And the Maryland scandal right now, it, it's, it's tied to football. And it has to do with the treatment of players from coaches. Uh, back in May, I believe, uh, a player died after a conditioning drill. Um, I believe he went to the hospital, was there for a couple days. Had uh, The number of his fever, I think, was like 106 or something like that. And he ended up passing away. And then players recently came out and kind of called out the coaches and said, hey, we're getting worked way too hard. The coaches are, are um, they're, I don't want to cuss, but they're, they're, they're douchebags. They're, they're, they're not, um, they're mean to the players. They're over aggressive. They make fun of them when they can't get up certain weights. And then they make them get up those certain weights, even if they physically can't do it. And it's just the, it's that intimidation, it's that that intimidation style of coaching, but it's gone too far. And with a, uh, I've I've had coaches that are kind of crazy before. I've had baseball coaches that were nuts. Uh, if any of my friends are listening, you know exactly who I'm talking about when I say that. But you, it's there's a certain level of the um, the coaching that just gets too far. And obviously, when a player passes away because of the conditioning. And they called out not just the head coach, but it was a lot of it was on the conditioning coach, the weightlifting coach. And a lot of those guys can kind of be a little inte- a little too intense and a little crazy. But uh, I think, you know, with a brother that's in football right now, practicing in the hot sun every day, I don't want, you know, I don't want my brother passing away because the coach needs his ego stroked because the player can't run 100-yard dashes. You know what I'm saying? So I think this type of, this type of coaching, there's a place for it. You obviously need to be loud. Coaches need to yell at their players in football. It's part of the game. But there needs to be a certain level where it stops. And when you're overworking players and making fun of them all the time, that's not cool. I get it. There's there's a manly part of football. You know, you don't want to be you don't want to be labeled a sissy in football, a guy that can't lift certain weights, a guy that can't run sprints. You don't want to be that guy that's missing the time. You know, they say, hey, we gotta get this done in two minutes. And you're running and you're too slow and you're overweight or something like that and you can't do it. You don't want to be that guy. But if it's happening all the time, it's too much. And obviously these, these players are, are calling them out and we're finding more and more out and it's getting worse and worse. So something will have to happen. This coach is on his administrative leave and I say that with quotations, but I'm sure he'll get fired and many others will get fired after this uh, incident. Jared, do you care that Yasiel Puig... And Nick Hunley brawled last night. Uh, I don't care, but this is a history that goes back to like 2014. Uh-huh. Uh, more so with Puig and Madison Bumgarner, the uh, San Francisco Giants ace, where there's been a lot of trash talk. Uh, Puig hit like a, a, a home run. I, I don't know if it was a game-winning home run or something like that, but Puig basically was rounding the bases and was looking at Bumgarner the whole time. Obviously, Bumgarner did not like that and uh, was basically like, don't look at me, don't look at me. Uh, I think it was in 2016 when Bumgardner uh, was walking off the field. Uh, Puig was over at first base, and Bumgardner kept saying, "Don't look at me." And then after the game, or you know, a couple of days later, Puig uh, put a selfie on Instagram with yeah. a shirt that said hashtag Don't Look at Me. So you know, uh, somewhat of a little banter there, back and forth. Um, listen, 
We obviously know that the Dodgers and the Giants don't like each other in the first place because of the rivalry that's gone back years and years. So for me, I think this is a good thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's getting fans, you know, kind of hyped up. Um, both of these teams are in the hunt for the playoffs right now. I don't think this is anything more than just good old fashioned baseball. Um, listen, in, in baseball, like when both benches clear, there's not actually fights, okay? So like, we're not gonna sit here and see guys kind of throwing blows at each other. Um, they don't like each other and that's totally fine with me. I don't, I don't, we don't need, you know, two teams, especially in the same division that just, you know, love each other and okay. <laughs> I'm okay with a little bit of intensity. Uh, I think that's good for the sport of baseball. So nothing actually happened really. Uh, there's just a little bit of shoving and stuff that went on. So not a big deal, uh, but I think it is good for the overall sport and good for this rivalry as a whole. Uh, Nick, do you care, speaking of brawls, that the uh, Redskins and the Jets got into a big brawl in their uh, joint practice? No, because every year I wait for the big brawl to happen in, uh, in, in football training camp. And whether it's, it's uh, we've seen a lot of in-team fighting so far. Uh, but this is the joint practice, and you've you, you got to know stuff's going to happen. These guys are practicing. It's the first time they're hitting other guys. Uh, because I believe this happened before the first... No, no, no. This just happened. In the, so it, 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 they're still not used to hitting other teams, and, and this stuff's going to happen. Like I said, I wait for it every year. Uh, I actually wanted to let you know something from the, the Jalen Ramsey question. The reason um, Dante Fowler Jr. was suspended was for fighting in practice. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he punched a teammate and, and would not stop. Like, he had to be held back and just went overboard. And then Ramsey was suspended for the Twitter stuff. So, um, there's, there's, there's stuff happening in training camp. And, and football players, obviously, a lot of them are characters. And a lot of them can get heated. And, you know, when you're blocking and it's hot and it's in the summer... Sometimes stuff happens, and then there's big brawls. I've seen the Cowboys get in the big brawl this year. Uh, the Cardinals seem to not get in the brawl. Maybe they should, because they tend to not. They never won Super Bowl before. So I'm waiting, <laughs> for, that. I'm waiting for that Cardinals brawl one of these days, but they, they seem like they, uh, they're, two, they're two good friends. So oh, not, boy. There's no, no Puig and Hundleys in the Cardinal, uh, Cardinals thing uh, going on right now. But no, I don't really care. The brawls happen in football all the time. Jared, do you care that Zion Williamson dunk from the free throw line? I do care. Uh, listen, like the last person to actually do this was Michael Jordan. Yeah. Now, granted, Michael Jordan uh, did it in a dunk contest, so it had a little more meaning. Zion Williams just did this in a practice, but still, the fact that the guy is basically a football player, I mean, he's like, how tall is he? Six? I think he's 6'6". Six, 6'6", six. Six, six, like, but he's like 280 pounds or something. I mean, this guy should be a tight end in the NFL. And then he's looked like that since like he was a sophomore in high oh, school. Oh, yeah. No, he's, uh, they, they put him up against uh, NBA players. And I think right now he's like the fifth biggest, uh, as that, far as weight-wise, fifth biggest player in the NBA. I mean, the guy's literally a man-child. He's a freak. Uh, Duke, by the way, has the top three recruits in all of college basketball. So Duke is expected to be play. Uh, you know, one of the top teams this year. They're actually in Canada playing in an exhibition series this week. So that would be fun to see that young nucleus play. But uh, no, for Zion, I mean, it, it's kind of just like he made a name for himself by dunking in high school and all the crazy windmill yeah, dunks exactly. and all the powerful dunks that he did. So it doesn't really surprise me that he was able to do this. It does a little bit because of just his body composure and the way that he's built. But he's just a freak of an athlete, and I'm really, really excited to see what him uh, and the rest of the team does along with Coach K for Duke this year. Nick, final question. Uh, do you care that Bruce Bowen will not be an announcer for the Clippers this upcoming season? No, not necessarily, because I didn't necessarily like that Bruce Bowen was an announcer last year. I liked uh, Mike Smith a lot better. I don't know. I still don't know what happened to him. Uh, one of the reasons I like that tandem and real quick, Bruce Bowen was fired for saying stuff about Kawhi Leonard uh, being critical. Well, Kawhi Leonard is not a member of the Clippers, but there was rumors that he might go to the Clippers because he was saying he wanted to go to LA and stuff like that. But um, the reason I liked Mike Smith and, and uh, Ralph Lawler, who's been there for, for years and years, was because, uh, because, of the, because of their extreme biasness towards the Clippers. When you oh watch, when, when the Clippers were playing the Warriors or they were playing one of those Christmas Day games, they always simulcasted it on the Clippers channel, Prime Ticket, here in, uh, here in California. And so I always turned on that broadcast because if anything crazy happened or Blake Griffin dunked or DeAndre Jordan dunked on somebody, these announcers went crazy and they were super biased. So Bruce Bowen kind of took that away a little bit last year. The Clippers, 
it, it wasn't the same feel. I mean, sometimes announcers can be part of the team in a way. Vince Scully was part of the Dodgers, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Chick Hearn, part of the Lakers. Uh, I, Stu Lance, there's, or Stu Nance, that's a guy for the Lakers. That, that I, he's part of the Lakers, you know, announcer crew and stuff like that. So, you, um, Bruce Bowen being on the staff a little bit last year as a Clippers fan, uh, made the games a little less fun to watch. Uh, I don't know what happened with Mike Smith. Obviously, if he did anything wrong, then he deserved to get fired or whatever. But um, we'll see. Maybe we have a return to Mike Smith, uh, possibly. But Bruce Bowen, I, I don't necessarily care that he's gone because I didn't necessarily want him there in the first place. Nothing personal against him. Just I like the biasness. I like I like my announcers cheering for them while they're announcing the game. I hate it. I can't stand watching <laughs> Clippers game. First of all, I'm a Lakers fan. Well, you're a Lakers fan, though. Yeah. Right. And Not I, just, a Clippers I fan. can't stand watching the Clippers <laughs> Whether I'm actually watching See, the Jared's, Jared's the echoing answers. what I'm talking about, though. He I, can't even watch it because it's uh, so bad. It's no thank you. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, all right, that's it for Do You Care? Uh, on the other side of this break, for the first time in a while, we're going to be doing a little cover five. And I'll explain what cover five is on the other side of the break. But we're going to be co- doing a little cover five. Aaron Rodgers, uh, Carmelo Anthony, other stuff like that. So that's going to be on the other side of the break here on the Cover 2 Podcast on OC Rock Radio. Well, Tiger Woods in the spotlight today, opening up this final round. This was his first hole of the day, so he finds the fairway bunker. And this is when you had a feeling it might be something special from Tiger Woods. I hope we can, you know, have hear comments or read comments and not get offended by things. This is a, this is a professional environment. It's not a personal environment. Um, the things I'm saying, and I don't have some vendetta against any player. I care about winning, number one. And I'm going to say and do the things I feel like can advance us. It's going to be tough at some points. It's not a popularity contest uh, all the time. You know, obviously, you know, as a human, you like being liked and appreciated. But I'm trying to win games because that's my that's my job. Welcome back to the show. We are on to our final segment with a little cover five. And uh, we're going to be getting to some Tiger Woods talk. He had a very uh, nice finish to his game uh, this past weekend, even though he didn't win. Uh, he kind of brought back a little bit of the old Tiger, mm-hmm. something that we haven't seen in a while. A lot of people are saying, is Tiger back? Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say that, but he did uh, kind of you know, get back into the game, and uh, he had one, you know, a couple really, really good shots. Uh, we are going to be talking about Urban Meyer and the whole situation going on at Ohio State with Zach Smith and uh, you know where that has gone, what we think is going to happen with that whole situation, whether Urban Meyer will... Uh, continue to be the head coach or whether he will eventually be let go. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, uh, a little critical of some of his young wide receivers and has some kind of harsh words for the entire team as far as practice goes. And we're going to finish it off with a little Carmelo Anthony uh, officially going to the Houston Rockets. But to start it off, uh, Tiger Woods. Nick, I want to get your thoughts first. Were you well, real, able to real see quick, it? I want to explain it. So the reason we call this Cover 5 is because we only can talk about these things for five minutes. So you're getting a quick take. This is not a segment-based thing. It's a it's for five minutes, so we're going to start the clock right now. I want to make sure I can pay, pay attention to the five minutes. So right now, so you were saying Tiger Woods. Obviously, I was unable to see this because I was still on my... Uh, on my trip and we did not have TV the whole thing so I followed it on social media as best I could um, so I will actually let you take over to start with uh, I'll kind of give my comments after about who won the tournament and about what I think about Tiger and stuff like that but uh, you were able to watch this correct uh, so I actually didn't get to watch the entire gotcha. thing what I did see was a lot of the highlights and the fact that Tiger was uh, nowhere near the leaderboard uh, at the beginning of the day mm-hmm. and then he kind of just he, he just crept back in, right? And he had a, an amazing shot from the rough. He literally had to curve the ball. I think it was uh, like 150 yards, curved it, and he got it within like probably four or five feet of the hole. Um, and it's just a shot that, one, that's what the old Tiger used to do. Yeah, yeah. But two, I don't think a lot of people were necessarily sure that Tiger could do that because of his back issues yeah, his back, and because yeah. a little bit older and because we haven't seen mm-hmm. Tiger make a shot like that in a long time. I mean, the crowd kind of went crazy. It was really, really funny. Um, there were two split-screen pictures, and one was back, I think, in like the I early 2000s. This. I saw this, yeah. uh, When, you know, it, the fans that were sitting and, and watching, and of course, everyone back then didn't have, you know, smartphones. Mm-hmm. So everyone's yeah. just actually watching Tiger hit. And then you go fast forward to 2018, and everyone has their cell phones out trying to take a picture. So that was really, really cool to see. But I think, listen... Tiger Woods, for, for golf as a whole, 
does not have to be the Tiger Woods of the early 2000s where he's completely dominating, winning championships, winning tournaments. Uh, for golf, Tiger Woods just needs to show up and play. Yeah. He is such a draw that he doesn't even need to be atop the leaderboards. He just needs to come out and play, and that is going to draw ratings. That is going to draw more fans, and I think that's going to draw more competition from the other golfers because, listen, if I'm another guy... I'm sitting here saying if I'm playing as Tiger Woods, I don't care if this guy's 80 years old, he's still Tiger Woods and he can still probably play, right? So it was really interesting and I think this was kind of a, a sad point for the leaderboards and, and excuse me for not knowing who exactly was at the top, Yeah. Um, but all the talk was about Tiger Woods. Oh yeah. The talk was not about who was sitting at number one and number two. Dude. It was all about Tiger Woods and that's kind of a good thing, but if I'm sitting there at the number one on the leaderboard chart, I want a little recognition. Like, I want my name being talked about on air. And everyone is sitting here talking about Tiger Woods. This Okay, so this shows you the power of social media and what it can do. So, when I was following it on... on I saw... I kept seeing Tiger. Tiger's like, Dom, he's coming back. And we were... I, I believe this was... The day this was happening was when I was driving back home, too. So, I, I really got to... I, I was on my phone the whole time. This is, you know, boring drive. But... I had no idea who won. I I literally had to like get home and get on the TV to see who won. I th I I had just assumed I actually forgot the PGA tournament was this weekend anyways because I was more concerned about, about the trip and I knew I was wasn't going to watch TV so it didn't matter. But I had no idea Brooks Kepka, who's won back to back U.S. Opens and already won the U.S. Open this year, won another major and I didn't even know that because social media was all about Tiger. You're completely right. That's all anybody cares about in golf, at least, or at least the people that I follow on, on Twitter and Instagram, stuff like that. They're casual golf fans, and they only care about Tiger Woods. But, man, that was crazy. When you look at the little trending thing on Twitter, all I saw was Tiger Woods. I had no idea who won. And I just want to give a shout out to Brooks Koepka, because Brooks Koepka is one of the best players in the game now. This dude knows how to win. He won the U.S. Open in one of the, the hardest courses ever. Uh, I mean, every they, they, nobody, barely anybody was even below par in that U.S. Open. He won that, and he wins this PGA uh, Championship, and uh, and nobody talked about him. And I don't know, I don't necessarily know if that's good for golf either. I think um, I, th I think it's good that Tiger's there, but there are a lot of great players. There's Dustin Johnson, Rory McIlroy, Jordan Spieth, uh, Ricky Fowler, uh, Brooks Koepka. And there's many others that are very, very good. Justin Thomas, the, the, I'll throw, throw him out there too. And uh, I don't know if it's necessarily good that Tiger gets that much praise to where, as a sports fan, I don't even know who won the tournament. But nonetheless, good for Tiger. I think this is a tease. I think he's winning a major next year. I think he's finally figured it out. Barring him getting injured or messing up his back again, I think he's going to win a major. There's no more majors to win this year. But I think he will win one next year. I think Tiger is somewhat back right now. All right, we just hit the five-minute mark. Switching to Urban Meyer, kind of switching tones completely here. Uh, we're, we want to talk about this because we weren't able to talk about this uh, this scandal on our last podcast two weeks ago. It kind of hit right after we, we talked about it. We just wanted to get our two cents. We'll give you five minutes of it here, right here. Urban Meyer, as you know, is put on administrative leave, a lot like the Maryland head coach. Because it came out that he kind of hid a domestic violence incident with one of his longtime assistant coaches. And for me, there's a double standard here. Because the Maryland coach will probably get fired. But Urban Meyer, one of the best coaches of all time, nothing is probably going to happen to him. Because this, he'll probably stay at Ohio State. They put him on leave or whatever so they can try to try to wash this under the bridge. And he'll become the head coach. I think it's double standard. I don't think it's good. It happens in a lot of sports, though. Um, the the one where it did it did really affect someone was obviously the Joe Paterno scandal. I'm not comparing the two because it's completely different things. But you do see this double standard with these these big time head coaches. Urban Meyer can kind of get away with stuff like this. You know, the guy coaching Cal probably can't. And you see this probably will happen with Maryland coach. I'm going to bet right now, if I had to put my money, I bet the Maryland coach gets fired, the Urban, uh, Urban Meyer does not. And it's, it's not similar, it's similar incidents, but it's, 
it's you know it's double standard. What do you think about this? Yeah, this one um, because we don't necessarily have all of the facts. It's, it's very tough to sit here and say Urban Meyer should be fired or he should not. No. Um, there is so much gray area to be determined. Uh, and obviously when you're talking about domestic violence, you want to be very careful in the words that you say. So this is what I'm going to say. Um, and it's just going to be very blunt. Urban Meyer obviously has a long relationship with Zach Smith going all the way back to his days at and Cincinnati Zach Smith is the and assistant Florida. Coach, yeah, yes, Zach about. Smith is the assistant coach who is being accused of the domestic violence against his wife. Uh, if, if, like I said, Urban Meyer has a long history with this coach, uh, Zach Smith has basically followed Urban Meyer wherever he has gone. And even took a break when Urban Meyer took a break from from uh, coaching, and then mm-hmm. he decided to take a job at Ohio State. Guess what? Zach Smith comes along. Uh, Brett McMurphy, the one who broke this story, uh, deserves a lot of credit for breaking this story because this is something that needed to be shedded light on. Um, unfortunately, you know, for years, it's not like this just happened two weeks ago, and this is fresh. This was like back in 2015, yeah, and it was somewhat covered up. Um, Urban Meyer. The the interesting thing is. How does Urban Meyer not know? Or, or you know, how does he um, just kind of brush it aside? Yeah. I mean, you, you've known this kid for years. He has basically been one of your pupils and a guy that you have groomed, right? Not to maybe take your job, but to eventually be a head coach somewhere else one day. Um, I mean, uh, Zach Smith's wife and Urban Meyer's wife are very close. They're all friends. It's just very, very odd mm-hmm. that Urban Meyer and his wife would not know anything um, and if they did know something, why they would not report it. Um, it it's, if Urban Meyer knew something and did not report it, he should be fired right now. There should be no administrative leave. There should be nothing. Um, if Urban Meyer knew something and reported it in the right protocol to which he knew, then that's a different story. Then that's, that's more on the administration. Right, then that's on the administration's fault for then hiding stuff. So, like I said, there's still a lot to be determined with this case. And so... Um, I don't want to sit here and speculate. Um, I'm just going to say if he knew about it and didn't do anything, and I'm speaking of Urban Meyer, then he should definitely be fired. If Urban Meyer knew about it and he went through the protocol within the right steps uh, that he knew, then you know I don't think he should be fired. Um, then there's, there should be someone else in the, in the administration that should take the blame for this. Either way, there was uh, domestic violence that occurred. Zach Smith should never be a coach again. Um, oh, absolutely, yeah, exactly. And, and, and there's still a lot more to come through this. Yeah, no, it will be interesting. You're right. There, not all the facts are out there, and it hasn't been... It's not. We're not talking and saying that Urban Meyer did this and he shouldn't, but what I'm saying is that there's probably... There could be a double standard that happens here, and like there, if there's, a, there's a coach in New Mexico State, the minute you hear domestic violence, that coach is probably fired, but Urban Meyer's put on administrative leave. So it's, you know, we'll, we'll find out what happens. We'll see how this affects the team. Too, because a lot of times when your coach is in all the scandals, uh, you, the team kind of doesn't play as well because they're focused on other things. So we'll see how Ohio State does as an actual team this season um, after this whole thing. But hopefully, um, this all gets resolved. And uh, if Zach Smith did this, he should absolutely be fired. Um, and same with Urban Meyer if this happened. Uh, all right, five minute mark. Switching on to Aaron Rodgers, uh, the same guy that said. Uh, said relax a couple of years ago. It's not necessarily saying relax this year. Uh, Jared, I think you know more about this than I do. Like I said, I was kind of off the grid a little bit. What did Aaron Rodgers say about his teammates? Uh, he came out and said some stuff to the media. What did he actually say? Right, so there was a practice last week, and, and I want to preface that by saying a practice. Practice. But when you're, Aaron, when you're Aaron Rodgers, a Super Bowl champion, and you have a young receiving core um, you need to be the leader and the one to step up. And apparently, from his mind, he did not feel that the receivers and some of the other players on the team were uh, you know, going as hard and focusing and doing their jobs, right? And so he, I'm sure he went to them privately, uh, you know, but he also came out uh, through the media. I'm sure the media asked him how the practice went. And he was flat out. And he said, uh, we didn't have a good practice. Guys were not focused. Guys were not ready. And guys were not prepared. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, supposedly, these are just reports, and these could be rumors, and this could be totally false. But supposedly, some of those players that Aaron Rodgers was talking about um, did not like that, right? They had a little bit of, uh, they didn't have thick skin. And um, listen, if you want to play with the Super Bowl champion, and you want to be the NFL, this is what it takes. You get thick skin. Um, yeah. th- th- you can't just show up to practice and be nonchalant. This isn't a high school. This isn't even college to where you can take a day off. All these guys are here trying to earn a job. 
and Aaron Rodgers wants guys sharp every single practice, every single rep, and apparently he didn't feel that way. So I don't really have an issue with this. Um, if Aaron Rodgers, like I said, the veteran on the team, the captain of the team, and a Super Bowl champion feels that his players need to practice harder and play better, then they probably need to practice harder, and especially from rookies, right? You, you, a rookie should have like zero say in what goes on. You go out there, <laughs> someone tells you to do something, and you need to do it. You need to, you need yeah. to earn your stripes, right? Once you've been in the league for a couple of years and you've proven yourself, then you can probably sit there and talk. But for rookies, they need to shut up, do their job, um, and, and basically listen to the veterans. Yeah. No, it, 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 this is why a show like Hard Knocks is so, it, it's so fun for the fans to watch because two of these examples you mentioned, um, you know, guys calling people out and rookies should do everything, was featured on Hard Knocks. You saw they, um, they made Baker Mayfield get an RV for the quarterbacks. Uh, and they made the other rookie stock the fridge and do all this other stuff while Drew Stanton and Tyrod Taylor, veterans, could essentially do whatever they wanted and go in the van. So that, that's see, the, the rookie mindset. You're right. You shut up. You do what you're told. Uh, not in the bullying sense like we saw with Richie Incognito and Jonathan Martin a couple of years ago. But there is that, that, that hazing a little bit of the rookies. And uh, to your point about Aaron Rodgers calling out teammates, we saw Jarvis Landry on the first episode of Hard Knocks call out people for not practicing hard and not showing up to practice. And I think this is good when guys are leaders, uh, and th these are the teams that win. And I expect the Browns to win, not only win games this year, because they didn't win a single game last year, but to win a, a, a few. They're going to win five or six, I believe. And because it looks like they have better leadership. I think Aaron Rodgers, to be honest, also is sick of not being in the Super Bowl conversation a lot, a lot of these years. You know, he's the best quarterback in uh, in the world as far as a talent goes, at least in my opinion. He's the most talented quarterback. And Tom Brady, with the coaching and the players and, and, the, and the system and Super Bowls, I, I, he's the best quarterback in the league. But um, Aaron Rodgers is clearly the most talented. And the guy is a lot of times just not put in the Super Bowl um, category, a little bit like Mike Trout. And I think... Rodgers sees this, and he's like, oh, we lost Jordy Nelson. Our, our roster might not be as good. You know, our defense is not as good. And now these guys aren't trying hard. Like, I would be frustrated, too. And I totally understand why Aaron Rodgers would say this. And these guys need to get the, they need to get the thick skin. I mean, just you guys need to deal with it. These are, these are younger players. What are you complaining about? Aaron Rodgers, I get he might come off as sort of a – he has a weird personality, and his personality is not liked by a lot of people. But still – I agree with you. The guy says something to you guys. He just wants the team to be better. He's not calling guys out like Ramsey, for example, just calling dudes out for no reason. Uh, he's being critical because he saw that the practice wasn't cool. And we saw Jarvis Landry do that on Hard Knocks. Uh, so this probably happens all the time. It's just because Aaron Rodgers is such a popular player and he's so talented, this happens. Um, and, you know, we'll see. We'll see how Green Bay is this year because... Um, they're always in that Super Bowl conversation, but it's never like they're the team. It's always, oh, because they have Aaron Rodgers. And I think they need to surround him with better players, and if guys aren't practicing hard, that's another reason why uh, why he's just he's frustrated. Yeah. All right, so there's a five-minute mark on that one. Uh, last segment of the Cover 5 segment. Our good old buddy Carmelo Anthony is in the news again. Uh, Carmelo obviously was uh, had an up-and-down year last year with the Oklahoma City Thunder. He uh, was traded to the Atlanta Hawks, and then he was released quickly by the Atlanta Hawks and now has signed with the Houston Rockets. Uh, it was pretty much the only team we thought he would sign with. Um, Jared, your thoughts? Uh, I know we've kind of projected this before, and we assumed he'd eventually sign, but now that he's actually signed, what are your thoughts on Carmelo Anthony to the Houston Rockets? Uh, this was expected, and nothing more. This isn't really breaking news, or this isn't anything that I uh, personally think can push the Rockets over the edge. And I don't mean that in any disrespect to Carmelo Anthony. I just don't feel that he is the same basketball player that he once was. Um, I think his ego is a little too high at this point. Um, I will say that I think this is a different situation than when he was with Mike D'Antoni in New York. Uh, when the Knicks traded for Carmelo Anthony from the Denver Nuggets, they literally gave up like the whole farm. And then Carmelo Anthony came over. At that time, he was a you know still in his prime and a much better player than he is today. But there were the expectations were, oh my gosh, the Knicks got Carmelo Anthony. They need to win the championship. And that yeah. was so unrealistic because of what they gave up. Here in Houston, you've got James Harden, you've got Chris Paul, you've got Clint Capella. 
Uh, you've got some pieces around you. I, I think the loss of Trevor Ariza is going to hurt them a little more than they think because of how versatile he was. But this team, uh, you know, competed with Golden State and, and had a solid chance of beating Golden State in the playoffs last year. So um, I think Carmelo Anthony, I think this all comes down to his mentality. Um, is he willing to take a back seat? And even if that means coming off the bench, who knows? Uh, maybe he can work something out with Mike D'Antoni to where he can start. But he needs to understand that he is going to be, at best, the third guy on this team. Oh, yeah. James Harden will easily be the number one. Chris Paul is going to be the ball handler. And Carmelo Anthony is then potentially the third guy. So if Carmelo Anthony comes into this thinking that he's going to be the 30, 35-point scorer that he used to be, uh, and he's going to be the constant starter you know, playing 30 to 40 minutes a game, then I think he's delusional. Yeah. Um, if he's willing to accept the fact that he needs to be the the, the veteran presence, uh, and you know if he needs to come off the brent the bench, I'm sorry, and uh, bring that kind of scoring, uh, you know, you know, for, with the second team, um, then I think this team can be something special. But if, like I said, it all comes down to how Carmelo Anthony wants to handle this, uh, he can still play at least on the offen- offensive side of the ball. So uh, we will see. I I don't think this is something like I said that will put them over the hump. Um, but I, you know, on a night to night basis, can he give him fifteen to eighteen points? Uh, yes, I think that can help. If if James Harden or Chris Paul goes down or they need to rest, can you bring Kamala Anthony in? Can he do some things? Yes. But uh, is this going to be the reason why the Rockets, you know, uh, beat the Golden State Warriors? I just personally don't think so. What team is better? Just looking on paper, this team or the Rockets team last year? Last year. Last year. Yeah, I, I think with with Trevor Ariza. Um, some of the other players that they had, um, I, I think they were a little more solid. Really, I think it came down to injuries. You know, Chris Paul got injured in that playoff totally. game against against the Warriors, and that could have been a totally different ball game. They should have beat them, right? Yeah. They they really should have. So I think if this team stays healthy, uh, or you know, a- along with the components that they had last year, I think that was a better team. Carmelo Anthony, to me, he's just he's older. He doesn't play any defense. He's a one dimensional guy. And he likes to shoot threes. Now, of course, Mike D'Antoni likes for his players yes. to shoot threes, so that could be a good match right D'Antoni there. D'Antoni also coached him in New York. For right, a while too. right, right. That. And all they did was shoot threes and lose. So <laughs> I just, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not too excited about it. Um, but then again, I'm not really too excited if Carmelo Anthony came to the Lakers or any other team. I think he's, I don't, I'm not calling him washed up. He's just not the player that he used to be. So I, don't, I just don't expect too much from him anymore. He's a role player. And until he, like we've said, until he understands that he's more of a role player and a spot starter, he's always going to, you know, he's going to disappoint fans. He's going to disappoint himself, and the media is going to keep calling him out. So until he understands that, you know, I, I don't think the, the, that he's going to be, you know, he's going to be a tough teammate to play with. Uh, I, I agree with you. I don't think the Rockets are as good as they were last year. Now, if Carmelo somehow returns to form, or even gets close, he's not going to return to form. It's a lot like Tiger Woods. He's not going to completely return to form. But if he's a really good player, and then they got a three-headed monster there, you know? But I honestly think he needs to embrace that bench role. Uh, The sixth man, come off the bench. You can still play a lot of minutes. You can still play 20, 25 minutes possibly in a game. But you help the team out with that depth because they did lose some depth in the offseason. All right, five minutes on that segment. Uh, still have a little bit of time to show, uh, Jared, so let's we actually get to do final thoughts. First time in a while, we can do final thoughts. So do you have a final thought you want to share, or do you want me to go first? I uh, take the lead. Okay, go ahead. I'll go first. So my final thought of the day uh, is going to be Dez Bryant. Uh, Jared knows a lot about this guy because he used to play for the Cowboys. Dez Bryant, uh, he's been in the news. Uh, the Browns have been talk- thinking about possibly signing him, and... Uh, he it was it was weird because he wouldn't take meetings with them and then he finally did take meetings with them so I think something will will, will progress in the next couple of days maybe right after this podcast they're gonna probably announce as Brian signs with the Cleveland Browns but if he does sign with the Cleveland Browns imagine this Jarvis Landry Josh Gordon and Des Bryant all in the same field if you said that like three years ago oh my goodness wow. uh, so we'll see I think they're signing Des. Um, as a safeguard if Josh, Josh Gordon is not okay because Josh Gordon still hasn't reported to camp. And uh, so, spoiler, if you're watching Hard Knocks, Josh Gordon is not going to show up to camp probably in the third episode either. But um, I think this is more of a safeguard. They probably won't pay him a lot. Um, Des Bryant's kind of in that same realm of Carmelo Anthony. He's not as good as he used to be, but he still does. 
and still demands money. It's one of the reasons the Cowboys cut him. But so that could be very dangerous. And if Dez plays like we know he can and Josh Gordon somehow returns to form and Jarvis Landry seems like he's playing the best, he's in his prime, man, the, the, this Browns team could be a lot, lot better than people think. And I might have to change my opinion about some of their how many wins they're going to get this season. But I, I, I'm interested to see that. Uh, I... I hope he stays in the AFC. Bryant signs with him stay in the AFC as a Cardinals fan. Uh, I don't want to see you in the NFC. The NFC is already stacked enough. I don't want to see uh, another good receiver join the NFC team. But very interesting to see uh, how the Browns do with these three wide receivers on their team, if they do sign Des Bryant. All right. Uh, my final thought, sticking with the NFL, is about the NFL's new uh, kind of head collision oh, yes. hitting yeah, good rule. Good point. This one is a little tricky, and for myself, I, I played cornerback, I played defense my entire football career. Um, this one is tough because obviously the NFL is, is looking for safety and looking for players to, when they do make a tackle, to keep their head up, right? Uh, use your shoulder, not the, the, the crown of your head or anything yes. like that. Um, they're trying to keep concussions down, CTE, all that stuff. I completely understand it. Um, and, and the fast-paced heat of the game, though, there's going to be times where a player, you know, maybe doesn't get his head all the way around. Or uh, an offensive player lowers their head and forces the defensive player to tackle in a certain way. Um, the, the referees in the preseason have been calling it very, very strictly. And I, I think that's a good thing because they're they trying, to, they're trying to set a tone yeah. that, hey, you know, we want the players to get used to hitting a certain way and this is what's going to be accepted, this is what's not going to be accepted. At the end of the day, um, I, I don't know necessarily how this rule is really going to help other than by slowing the game down um and what i mean by that is as as a player when you are not running at full speed when you have to stop and think about what you're doing i think that's when more injuries can happen um not to say that injuries no, can't happen when that, two yeah. players are going 100 miles an hour i understand that but if one player is coming at you 100 miles an hour and you stop and you're going like 50 to 60 miles an hour because you have to think about how you're going to hit someone, one of two things is going to happen. You are not going to tackle them with the right form because you're going to be thinking too much about it. You're going to probably cause an injury to either yourself or the other person, or you're going to completely miss the tackle. You're going to let that person run by you, and then you're going to get benched because you're not playing well enough, right? So there's a lot of variables that go into this and this is a very tricky subject because listen i'm in no way sitting here saying that i condone straight helmet to helmet hits i'm all about safety but this game is called football and it's football for a reason there is a reason why they have shoulder pads there's a reason why they have helmets um and i feel that there are only so many rules that can be put in place uh while still keeping the game intact if you don't want helmet to helmet hits then take the helmets off and put flags on them. Yeah. This is well, I'm not watching it. They put unfortunately, flags on. this is it's it's this is a part of the sport. This is what yeah. football is. Um, I this may be sounding way too harsh, and if it is, you know what? That's okay. But this is just my own opinion. These are grown men who are choosing to play this game. Yeah. Right. Of course, no one wants to see injuries. No one wants to see brain injuries or concussions or anything like that. But it is a part of the game. And like I said, these players. Are choosing to play this game there's no one that's being forced to play yeah. there's a million other jobs in this world that these players could be doing right now they're choosing to play football so if they're choosing to play football they should also understand what the repercussions could potentially be so I, I, I just I think that there are too many rules in place right now uh, so the players are now playing slower and are playing more hesitant which can mm -hmm. cause injuries the referees have so much that they have to remember and understand and, and rule by that I think they're kind of unaware and sometimes not sure of what's legal and what's not legal. And with all these rules in place, um, I actually think it's a bad thing for football. I'm not, I, I think the game needs to be simplified a little more. Um, and at the end of the day, I think you're going to see more injuries um, because players are going to have to think more. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I agree pretty much with everything you just said right there. Uh, this rule, watching the Cardinals game, the, the, the most famous one of these calls from last week was a Cardinals safety that just hit a guy. There was really nothing wrong with it. And they threw a flag and people were like, what are we doing? Tony Jefferson, uh, one of the, the, the really good safeties for the, the Ravens, came out and said, how am I supposed to even tackle that? Right. If this is the way it is. So, rule sucks. 
You're right. It's ruining football. I think if it gets too crazy, though, they will adjust the rule and change it during the season, though. I think they have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then games are going to go... They, they, you know, they want games to be a little faster and have less commercials. Well, by having less commercials and then adding flags, it's the same amount. People are going to be bored, and you're only going to really watch your own team. So I hope they change the rule, too. Thank you for the music right there. Uh, it signals the end of the podcast. All the podcast today, Jared, as usual. A uh, little announcement right here. We're going to be doing our... NFL season predictions are a big show. Uh, it's a lot like our our draft show we do. We get excited. It's one of our two big shows of the year. Uh, and so we're going to be doing that in two weeks after week three of the preseason because uh, after week three, that week four of the preseason is kind of a lot of backups trying to earn spots. So once we kind of see the rosters and everything filled out, uh, we're going to decide and, and tell you who we think is going to win Super Bowl, all that stuff. So our big NFL season predictions podcast in two weeks. As far as next week goes, we're going to have a podcast as usual. We'll be talking about the current news. Um, for Nick Nina, I'm Jared Smith. And this has been the Cover 2 Podcast.